that expression be nourished in the words of faith were words that uh, an expression that uh, the Apostle Paul directed to a young man that we hold out to be a sterling example of Christianity in the first century. Uh, in its entirety, verse 6 of First Timothy chapter 4 says, By giving these advices to the brothers, you will be a fine minister of Christ Jesus, one nourished with the words of the faith and of the fine teaching which you have followed closely. This concept of being nourished with the words, we might think of particularly in connection with the Bible and our regular Bible reading, and certainly uh, that is integral to our being nourished in the faith. However, many wonder, how is it that we receive not just the Bible, but the uh, nourishing words that uh, come to us in the Christian publications. And uh, I thought that we might spend a little bit of time this evening just sort of reviewing some of the process that is involved in our individually receiving the nourishing words of faith. Uh, my wife and I uh, serve at the uh, Brooklyn headquarters of Jehovah's Witnesses. I've been working there for 47 years now. Uh, some say I came when I was two, uh, but in any event, 47 years there, and 42 of them in the writing department. And that uh, provides somewhat of a unique insight into uh, the preparation of spiritual material because as a Watchtower article I'm not sure if it's been published yet. There's a Watchtower article that discusses in a very one-page form the uh, governing body of Jehovah's Witnesses and how it's formulated or organized into different committees. And one of those committees is the writing committee. It is composed of four brothers of the anointed who are members of the governing body, and then there are five brothers of the other sheep who are assigned as helpers to them. And uh, these brothers are particularly involved in the oversight of the preparation of spiritual material. And they are brothers of uh, different backgrounds. One of them is a married man who raised children. Another one is uh, from England. Another one is from Canada. They're brothers of different backgrounds and experiences and different qualities. And they provide guidance and oversight as to the preparation of articles, material in the books. And they are of different uh, personal experience or qualifications. In the past, uh, one of the ones who I had the uh, privilege of working with quite closely was Brother Fred Franz. You may have heard of him uh, for a time. He served as the president of the Watchtower Society and was a, a real scholar of the Bible and contributed a great deal. Uh, for some time, I was able a couple of times a week to go see Brother Fred Franz and to present to him questions that had been submitted from the field. Some of the questions where we were able to answer based on the publications. Others we would uh, seek out his personal knowledge and insight on. And uh, his knowledge of the Bible truly, truly was profound. That was uh, particularly called to my attention one occasion when after presenting a series of questions that had been submitted and that was finished. And I said, Brother Franz, um, I have a personal question I'd like to ask you, and it has to do with this verse. And I, I read to him a verse in the Psalms, and it was not one of the well-known Psalms, Psalm 37, Psalm 72, but it was what you might call one of the somewhat unknown Psalms, the Psalm that we don't read very much. Uh, and I wasn't trying to trick in any way, Brother Franz, but I didn't happen to mention what psalm it was or what verse it was. I just said, now, Brother Franz, I'd like to ask you a question about this verse, and I, I read the verse. And then I said, now, Brother Franz, does that mean, and I offered 
a, an explanation of what it seemed to mean. And he thought for a few seconds and he said, no, no, it couldn't mean that because the verse before it says, and he quoted the verse before it, and I hadn't even said what psalm it was or what verse it was, and he quoted the verse before it and then explained both verses in the context of the entire psalm, which I hadn't even said what psalm it was. Uh, Brother Franz is not serving with us on earth any longer, but it does help you to appreciate the uh, profound knowledge that has been able to be transmitted by brothers of the governing body, though not all having the same personal experience as Brother Franz. But some wonder, though, how is it that material is selected for development in the publications? It doesn't all happen in one way, but it's interesting in an account that you're probably quite familiar with in Acts chapter 15, there was a problem that arose in the field. You recall up in Syria, Antioch, a question arose whether Gentile converts to Christianity needed to be circumcised. And there was quite a bit of debating back and forth about it. And so they mandated uh, or dispatched Paul and Barnabas to go down to Jerusalem and present this question to the governing body. And what did the first century governing body do? Well, they discussed it. And they weren't all initially of the same mind about the matter. They examined the scriptures the Bible specifically refers to one passage in the prophets that they analyzed and applied to the question. And they certainly had the help of the Holy Spirit because that passage in the Bible was written under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. They prayed about it, asked for Holy Spirit. They were men who themselves were anointed with Holy Spirit. And then they reached the conclusion, as you well know, that uh, it was not necessary for new converts who were not Jews to get circumcised and then they enumerated the things that were necessary for uh, new converts to Christianity in the first century to abstain from fornication, blood and things sacrificed to idols. But that, that same process uh, of how a question might arise and then be submitted to the governing body occurs today. The, for example, there was a question that arose one time in the field about whether somebody who at one time was a drug addict, a heroin addict, and in order to overcome his heroin addiction, uh, he was being treated with methadone, which is of itself quite addictive, but it doesn't produce the uh, highs of heroin, whether a person who was a former heroin addict and now using methadone, whether he would be in position to be baptized. Question arose in the field. It was submitted to the governing body. It was discussed in the light of the scriptures and seeking the help of the Holy Spirit. And a conclusion was reached. And what happened in the first century after a conclusion was reached? They wrote down the conclusion and then gave it to Paul and had him deliver in writing the directive from the governing body in the first century. And essentially the same thing happens on some occasions with regard to questions that might arise in the field, be discussed by the first century, I mean by the modern day governing body. And then instead of being handwritten in a personal letter, uh, are prepared, assignment might be made to some uh, brother or brothers to prepare an article. And then that is eventually uh, translated and printed for the whole brotherhood worldwide to be nourished by these words of faith, the conclusion reached. So the same process that uh, was followed in the first century is on occasion still being followed today. But who are used to do this? It is under the direction of the anointed brothers of the governing body, but just as there are brothers of the other sheep who serve as helpers to the committees of the governing body, there are brothers uh, of the other sheep as well as the anointed who are assigned to prepare written material. In New York, uh, there are something like 
25 brothers from different backgrounds, from Australia, from Japan, from different places, who are part of the writing staff and who might be uh, assigned to prepare a, an article or a material in a book. And anything that is prepared has to be reviewed by the writing committee, all of the writing committee, and then by all of the governing body. There is also, though, a brother, our brothers, in other countries who are assigned to prepare material. There are writers at the branch offices in Germany, France, England, Canada, Mexico, Japan, Spain, South Africa, Australia, and other places. And these brothers might send in suggestions of problems or things that they see, they perceive uh, in their area that are needs for the uh, brotherhood. And there are also visiting brothers of the governing body as they travel around the world or, or others representing them who will examine what are the needs, what does the brotherhood need. And then the suggestions are submitted. Uh, eventually, there may be a conclusion that a particular book is needed, such as, will there be a new book this coming district convention? I'll leave that with you as just a question. But if, if there should be such, uh, you can be sure that it was based upon a perceived need, and then that might be developed. Or it may be that uh, there is a, a perceived need of something to be used in the field. For instance, some time ago, uh, in connection with material placed in the field around Christmas time, uh, instead of always having very, very similar articles about the background of Christmas and the Christmas tree and Santa Claus and so forth, an assignment was made to a brother in St. Petersburg, Russia, to develop an article on Christmas from that standpoint. And that article was assigned to the brother to prepare a year and a quarter before it was to appear in print. Why? Because he had to do research on it, and then he would also see that appropriate photography was taken. And obviously, you couldn't do uh, photography with pictures about uh, a Christmas scene or uh, a winter scene in Moscow or St. Petersburg. You couldn't do that in July. It would have to be done around Christmas time. So one year, uh, in September, he was assigned the article, the photography was done that Christmas time. Then he worked on the article and in February or March sent the completed article from his standpoint to headquarters. Then more experienced writers went over the article, modified it some, made it of the appropriate length for printing in the magazine, and then it appeared the following December 15 issue. So there, there is quite a, a lot of advanced preparation that goes into the magazines. Now, this brother down here has got a watchtower and a wake. You have the watchtower there? Take this one as an example, the April 15 watchtower. And uh, this subject, what is Armageddon? Now, a lot of thought went into not just the article itself, but how to make it appealing. For example, if you had to, you were assigned to design a cover for a magazine on what is Armageddon, what cover would you come up with? What would it look like? Are you going to show a, a mushroom cloud of an atomic explosion? Well, that's not really... Some people think that's Armageddon, but it's not. Are you going to show some gruesome picture of dead bodies? Possible, but, you know, there are some people who get turned off by that and, and have declined to accept our magazines because they don't want something real gruesome laying around their house. What do you, th what do you think about that cover? 
Interesting concept. Huh? And then the magazine had to be laid out to uh, appear in the right place. For example, were you aware that because of our printing presses, um, the articles in our magazine appear with four successive black and white pages, then four color pages, four black and white pages, four color pages. Were you aware of that layout? For example, you look at this. Black and white page, black and white page, black and white page, black and white page, then four color page, color page, color page, color page, then four more black and white, black and white, black and white, black and white, then four color pages, etc. Now that may be, well, what difference does it make? It may explain something that you have wondered about in the past. Sometimes there'll be something we're studying in the watchtower, we're reading, and a point is made, and then you turn over the page, and there's a picture of what was discussed. But why wasn't the picture with the paragraph being discussed? Well, it could be, for example, that this illustration here, maybe it was actually discussed on this page. But that might be a black and white page. So if we had that picture over here, it would have to be a black and white picture. But by putting it here, it can be more attractive. We can have it in color. And it's close enough that you still link it to what's under discussion. Well, that sort of layout information has to be analyzed in preparing the articles and where they're going to appear in the magazines. After all of the articles have been prepared, written, then they go through a proofreading stage. And uh, accurate grammarians proofread them, all in English, initially. And then, after that, some work is done to help to prepare the material for translation, because we've got a, a thousand translators around the world uh, working on the translation of our publications because they appear in so many languages. And uh, questions that the translator might have might not be clear if it's only presented in English. For example, let's just say the article said, uh, Sam learned the truth from his friend at school, talked with his teacher, and then told his uncle about it. Why can't you translate that into German? But you say, Sam learned it from a friend in school. Is that a male friend or a female friend? Makes a difference in German, doesn't it? And then he spoke with his teacher. Uh, well, how are you going to translate it if you don't know if the teacher is a male or female? And then he told his uncle. Do you know there's a lot of languages that don't have a word for uncle? In their languages, it says father's brother or mother's brother. And so if, if they're not told, how are they going to translate it correctly? And maybe in Persian, they're going to translate it, it was the father's brother. And in Thai, they're going to translate it, that was the mother's brother. And if somebody could read both of those things, they're going to say, this is fiction, because, you know, it doesn't even agree. So a lot of research has to go into it. And to indicate after friend, male or female. After teacher, male or female. After uncle, father's brother, mother's brother, and in Oriental languages, they need to know, is it the father's older brother or the father's younger brother? Because they have different words for it. However, if the translators have that little indications in the text, then they save a lot of time. You don't have to worry about it translating it into Yoruba. You don't have to worry about it translating it into Indonesian. It's there. Oh, okay. And then they can move on through the translation. Or there's other accuracy issues. Uh, 
let's say Dietmar was on the road and he almost hit a buffalo. What kind of buffalo? What kind of animal did he hit? Was it a bison like this out in the Montana in the United States? Or was it a Cape buffalo like down in South Africa? Or was it a water buffalo like in Indonesia? And if the translators didn't know, you can imagine how much time they would spend trying to figure this out. And maybe some of them would be right, some of them would be wrong. And so there's a group of sisters. My wife works with that group. And they do the research and put after buffalo the exact species so that the Indonesian translator, the Zulu translator, they would all be able to look it up in a dictionary. Oh, that's the species? Then this is the name in our language and get on with the work. And then when all of this work is done, the text is sent out electronically around the world. So in South Africa, they might have 14 languages they're working on translating in. Korean, Korea, they're working on Korea. Japan on Japanese. And they're in the process of translating. Meanwhile, back at Brooklyn, all of the text in English is circulated in the governing body. And all of the brothers spend time and a lot of time necessary to read all of the publications, to read all of the text, and not just read it, but to analyze it as this correct. Should we say this? Or could it be said in a different way? Is it going to create problems in some countries where there's a military issue or an, a neutrality problems? Is it going to create problems in some countries where there are racial tensions or, or sectarian violence? And they may, the governing body members may change the text. And then when it comes back, the brother assigned for that magazine has to make all of the necessary adjustments. And then on Monday afternoon, the writing committee meets with the brothers from the art department and the entire layout or design of that magazine is considered. So, today is Wednesday. Monday, this last Monday, the writing committee met and they considered every page of the September 15 watchtower. Here we are in March. They're deciding, finalizing the design of the September 15 watchtower. And in the process, they may make adjustments, even textual adjustments. How is that caption for a picture clear? Is it going to stimulate the reader to think and understand what the reason for that illustration or picture is. And finally, when it's all done, then this electronic text is sent out again to the translators. Now, you've already finished your translation in Zulu. You've already finished your translation in Indonesian. Now you get the final text and you put it into a computer. Computers are dumb machines, but a computer can compare. This is the original English text and this is the final English text. And the computer compares it. It doesn't know one is better than the other. All it says, there's a difference between the original text and the final text. And so the Zulu translator goes to her Zulu text where she had translated maybe Satan, the original liar and murderer. And she's translated that into Zulu. But then the final text says simply, the devil. All right, she goes to the Zulu text, takes out the Zulu equivalent of Satan, the original liar and murderer, and puts in the equivalent, the Zulu equivalent of the devil. The translation's finished, ready to print in South Africa, the same time they're printing in Zelters, in England, in Korea, and around the world. And that's why <clears throat> when we study the Watchtower, the same material that we're studying in the congregation can be printed, distributed, and studied by 95% of our brothers around the world are studying the same material, and they all can be nourished in the faith with really, really good effect because the way we are spiritually fed, the way we are spiritually nourished is touching people around the globe, people that you've never met and maybe until the new order you never will meet. 
but they're being nourished as you are. That was called to my attention some time ago. My wife and I serve, uh, though my wife is from Berlin, she's a uh, native of this country, but she went through missionary school in New York and served in South America. And uh, now we're in Brooklyn serving in an Italian language congregation. And uh, we went with a group of Italians to an international convention in Nairobi, Kenya. And at the uh, last day of the convention, we were having a, a final meal for our international group. And we invited two missionaries serving in East Africa to come and relate some experiences. And one of the missionaries, who is now an instructor of the Gilead School, he told of an assignment he had some years ago to uh, go and teach pioneer school in a remote part of Tanzania. And he was bringing with him something that at that time was very, very new and had not been known of in that part of Tanzania. And it was the original video, Jehovah's Witnesses, the organization behind the name. I'm sure most of you have seen it, perhaps seen it repeatedly. But the pioneers in this remote area of Tanzania had never seen it. And maybe uh, television was not that common in that remote area. But the brother went there to teach the pioneer school, and he wanted to show the pioneers this video. However, there was a problem of finding a television and a recorder, a VCR, in order to play the video. And he finally located a local businessman, a store owner, who had both a television and a VCR. And he asked, would it be possible to bring the students of this pioneer school to see this video? And the man agreed. And so one morning, the brother went to the man's uh, store where he had a large room and over on one side of this television and VCR and got it set up. And in time, a bus came with the pioneers from Pioneer School and the first brothers and sisters, local brothers and sisters, came in and they, they stood on the wall or near it. And then some more came and they came in near them and some more and all standing there or sitting there, and eventually it was time to show the video. So the uh, missionary said to him, okay, well now, you can come on closer to see the video that I want to show you. And they responded, no, no, that's all right, brother, that's all right, we're okay, fine. And so he proceeded to put on the television and show them the video, which the brothers thoroughly, thoroughly enjoyed, realizing that this was a provision of the faithful slave. When it was over, the missionary asked the local pioneers. Now, brothers, at the beginning, I, I invited you to come closer to see it better, you know, but why didn't you? And one of the local pioneers said, well, brother, most of us here have never seen television before. All we know about television is what we read in the watchtower, that television is dangerous. <laughs> And they took it very, very, very literally. Now, we read the same watchtower. <laughs> Do we think less of the advice? Or are those brothers perhaps being nourished in the faith in a way that we're missing out on? Then the missionary asked them, well, what did you uh, take away by way of lessons from the video? And one one of the pioneers said, well, brother, in the video, it, it had a section where it said that um, each year or so, individuals come, brothers and sisters come from various parts of the United States, come all the way to Brooklyn. Some even come from other countries to play instruments in an orchestra to record music. Is that correct? Yes. And the video said that they buy their own tickets Airplane tickets and fly all the way to New York. Yes. And they were all well dressed. The brothers had jackets on and ties, which maybe in that part of Tanzania was not that common. Yes. And, and one of them, the little 
piece in the video showed a brother, and he had this instrument that looked like a triangle, and he had a little stick, and he went, ding! Yes? So, you mean, the pioneer said, that this brother flew from some distant part of the United States, bought an airline ticket, flew all the way to New York, dressed up with a jacket and a tie to go, ding! (laughs) And the missionary said, I I guess so. And the pioneer said, "That's, that's what I took away from the video, that in Jehovah's organization... Whatever you're assigned to do, whether it's something big and important and visible or something seemingly small, such as ding, you do it as your contribution to the work of serving Jehovah. I related that experience at a a one-day special assembly in Los Angeles some time ago. And after the program on Sunday... This uh, sister came up to me with her little daughter, and she said, You know that brother with ding? She said, That's my husband. (laughs) And he's a professional musician. He plays drums and cymbals, a professional percussionist. But the only piece that they little, the little clip that they used in the video was ding. Now, how many times have we seen that video? Would we have come away with such a lesson that our brothers are seemingly limited brothers in a remote area in Tanzania got out of a provision for nourishment of the brotherhood that we get? So the information presented for our nourishment is something that we should take to heart think about, and apply in in our reactions. I mentioned my wife had served as a missionary in uh, South America, in Chile, and uh, last year, a longtime friend who was uh, an elder in the congregation, Valdivia, Chile, where she had served, came with his wife to visit Brooklyn. his, His lifetime goal was to visit headquarters, and he came uh, Ugo and Naomi uh, Parada. And while they were visiting us, Ugo Parada told us of something that happened, recently happened in that congregation in southern Chile, uh, Valdivia, Chile. He said that there was a sister in that congregation who was very, very, very poor to the point that the elders in the congregation were seriously concerned about her having her means a means to live and have enough to eat. Well, what could they do about it? He said that, that the elders discussed it among themselves and concluded that what they were going to do was spread the word in the congregation via the uh, book studies that there was someone, they didn't say male, female, young, old, no identification anyway, there was someone in the congregation who was truly, truly needy. And the elders had determined that what they were going to do on Saturday morning was put a box in the kingdom hall. And then anybody who wanted could come and contribute something, food or or money or whatever. And the elders would see that whatever was contributed would be taken to this needy brother or needy uh, member of the congregation. And Hugo Parada told us that he, Saturday morning, was at the Kingdom Hall early. The box was there, and the door opened, and a sister came in with a kilo of rice, two and a half pounds of rice, maybe worth, what, 80 cents, I don't know, and half a euro or something, and put that in the box for the needy person. It was the sister. The needy sister, the first one to come and make a contribution. Others came afterward, they put things in the box, and later the elders took the whole box and brought it to the sister. Surprised, shocked, had no idea that this was for her. 
there's someone who was nourished in the faith. The generosity that we read of the widow's mind, she applied it. Now, you don't know that sister. I don't know her personally, but she is one of your sisters, serving loyally, receiving the spiritual food that you are receiving, and allowing it to move her to respond in a Christian way. Well, a lot of your brothers and sisters will be coming together this weekend for the memorial, and they're putting forth a great deal of effort to invite people, and hopefully many new ones, interested ones, will come here. As far as what we do in inviting people and helping them in terms of the English congregation here in Karlsruhe, what can you do this week and in the weeks and months to come. Yesterday, or Saturday, no, Monday it was, in the Bible reading, there was a, a comment made that I'd like to just repeat for you. If you open your Bible to Mark chapter 14, and keeping up with your Bible reading, likely you read this passage because it was the first of the Bible reading for the memorial season this year. It was the familiar account of Mary, who soon before Jesus' birth, I mean death, uh, had some perfumed oil, and she came and anointed Jesus with it. And uh, there was some complaint, stimulated apparently by Judas, over the use of the money in that way. He would rather have had that money put in the purse that he could steal from. And uh, so in verse 5, uh, Mark chapter 14, verse 5, there was this complaint about the uh, use of the money that way. And Jesus said in verse 6, Let her alone. Why do you tr make trouble for her? She did a fine deed toward me. For you always have the poor with you, and whenever you want to, you can always do them good, but me you do not have always. She did what she could. She undertook beforehand to put perfumed oil on my body in view of the burial. Now, that uh, verse 8 there contains an interesting expression. She did what she could. In American English, I'm not sure how much it's used here, but in American English there's a colloquial, a modern colloquial saying, well, do what you can. And the, the sense that that often conveys is, don't kill yourself. Don't work too hard. Don't work up a sweat. Well, just, just do what you can. But here, in connection with this woman, think about what Jesus said in verse 8. She did what she could. It's interesting that Jesus didn't focus on what she could not do because there was a lot, a lot that this woman could not do. Could she become a missionary traveling with the Apostle Paul? No. Should be, could she become a teacher in the congregation? No. Could she establish new congregations? No, that wasn't within her ability. Could she become an elder, a ministerial servant? Never. There was a lot that this woman, Mary, could not do. But Jesus didn't focus on, oh, there's a lot she can't do. He praised her for having extended herself in what she could do. And what she could do was a lot. Because we know, we've read, studied and read it, that uh, what she put on Jesus was perfume that was the value of a year's wages. Now, you husbands might think of how much you earn in a year. And imagine if your wife, you come home one day and she spent that much on a little bottle of perfume. Well, Jesus wasn't a married man. He didn't face that problem. But he did praise this woman for how much she extended herself. And think 
of this woman, Mary, entering into a gathering of Jesus and the apostles, and, and they're indignant over there. They're not happy to have her there, some of them. And yet she went in out of appreciation for Jesus and did what she could. And Jesus picked that out and praised her for it. So, really, if Jesus is the same yesterday and always, in terms of what we do today, tomorrow, before the memorial, the weeks after the memorial, we who have been regularly nourished in the faith by the Word of God, to think that Jesus and Jehovah God will be looking down seeing us exert ourselves, extend ourselves, and be very pleased if we do what we can in praising Jehovah.